Uh, so anyway, uh, this welcome to my new playlist, which is uh, Musing Music. And basically, it'll be kind of like a fireside chat, um, virtually. Uh, ideas about music, thoughts about music, thoughts about practice and how to approach practice from a psychological viewpoint, um, so on and so forth. But I've had so many ideas and thoughts that usually uh, come out when I'm working with a student one-on-one -on -one and uh, they need a little adjustment to their attitude or about practicing or they need a little encouragement about how to express themselves better uh, on their instruments, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, that's the, the function of this playlist is to have this discussion. You'll notice I'm smoking a cigarette because that's how casual this is going to be. I'm just going to be really kind of chill and talk about things I want to talk about. It's This is not going to be free association, generally speaking. I mean, I have a subject I want to broach today, uh, which will be 432 hertz, which, uh, my God, there's plenty of thoughts about it, but I have a different perspective on it. I don't, I don't think you'll see it from anywhere else, uh, based on the true facts. In any case, uh, before we go into that, though, let me just talk about my other playlist, the Fragments of Infinity series one, two, and three, which would be the Greek modes, the major minor key system, and the blues. I'm almost complete on the blues, um, but I want to wrap it up with a compositional tool that emerge from the blues and yet transcends the blues entirely. In other words, it doesn't, when you use this composing technique, the music will not necessarily sound like blues. However, when you solo against it, you can use the blues principles, which is uh, minor under major. Um, so I'll be getting to that. Also, I never really felt as if uh, the major minor uh, key system was complete. Uh, there's so much to dive into with that. I kind of took a break and maybe if I get inspired in the future, I'll be adding more to that playlist. As far as the Greek modes goes, that's done. Blues is just about done. Uh, if I have any further uh, things I feel I need to present about blues, I'll, I'll definitely uh, put a video up there. Um, now, regarding this playlist, Musing Music, you'll notice that the term muse is uh, buried inside of the word music. And what interest, I was thinking about this on the way home from the coffee shop uh, back to my place. Um, kind of strolling along on a cold but sunny, beautiful day here in Venice, I was thinking about, or musing, music, and how this word muse is thrown in there. Now, of course, there in the Greek uh, mythology, there were nine muses, right? Now, the, the muse, let me see if I could find it. The, uh, yeah, Euterpe, the muse of music is is the name, uh, the goddess named Euterpe. Not really a goddess, but uh, I think they're thought of as... Um, nymphs, which is great, you know, everyone could use nine nymphs. In any case, uh, yeah, where was I? So uh, this word muse is embedded inside the word music. Now, bear in mind, music isn't called euterpe, it's called music. So in other words, music itself is the muse, okay? It's the thing which inspires. And uh, euterpe actually means uh, delight to be delighted, okay? So um, this idea that music itself is the muse, uh, when you think about it, music does inspire people and move people. Um, the rhythm of music will make people want to get up and dance. That's an inspiration. That's moving towards something. That's animating a person beyond what they were normally doing. Geez, even if you're listening to music and tapping your foot, it's affecting you just by the fact that you're going along with the beat. Uh, on the heart realm, when we talk about melody and uh, that sort of thing, music can move you to tears. It can awe you with its beauty. Um, so the tears don't have to be sad tears. They could be tears of maybe you've experienced before when you saw something so beautiful that it moved you to tears. Um, so that's another inspiration, the emotional movement that, that's created inside of a human being when they listen to certain types of music. Um, and finally, uh, intellectual uh, movement, complex harmonies that we find in jazz and later classical music 
really stimulate the mind and create an atmosphere in the mind to be thinking in a new and different way inside the frame of that sound. So music itself is the muse. It is the ins inspiring factor. Um, that's my thought on that. Now, 432. All right. I'm just another voice in the wilderness talking about this stuff. But uh, I happen to be friends with Rex Weiler, who is one of the founders of Greenpeace and also a total music nerd. Like he, he wrote a book called uh, The Story of Harmony. And I think you can actually find it. Uh, if you look it up, Rex Weiler, W-E-I-L-E-R, R-E-X, Rex, um, The Story of Harmony. Um, basically, this book is uh, it's talking about what I mentioned uh, early on in the Greek mode stuff about uh, temperament and how temperament was constantly messed with how our music, how our notes are tuned in respect to each other. And I've said before a number of times that uh, what nature gave us and what we're listening today are two totally different things. OK, uh, what nature gave us is um, a situation. It's uh, if you've ever heard of the Zen koan, what did your face look like before you were born? Or what is the sound of one hand clapping, that sort of thing? This is an insolvable puzzle. It's a puzzle that you cannot ever make peace with. Um, what I mean to say is this. When Pythagoras was working, uh, kind of uh, codifying the musical system we use today, it started out with the sound of, of a, um, an anvil he heard. And I've told this story before. Uh, basically, he took a metal bar and clanged it, hung it from a string and clanged it. He cut the bar in half and got the perfect octave. In other words, if two equally sized bars, equal weight, will, will intone the same note. Then he found out if you cut the bar into a third, you get a fifth. Now, in music, the circle of fifths, you, if you keep going around the circle of fifths, you'll wind up hitting every single note of the 12 notes in our system until, voila, you arrive at the octave again. So that would be uh, C, G, D, A, E, B, F sharp. This is where I have a hard time. <laughs> F sharp, C sharp, uh, G sharp, uh, G sharp, G sharp. Did I say D sharp already? Well, anyway, it just goes around. I can't think today, so pardon me. Uh, but you go around the circle of fix. Eventually, you hit the octave. But here's the thing. When you cut this bar into a third, um, you cannot divide the number one by a third and get an even number. You'll get an infinitely repeating fraction. Whereas with the half, with the octave, you get a perfect, um, you know, half it's uh, you know 0.5 so the problem here is that as you go around the circle of fists with these uh, uh, uh with this bar cut into thirds what happens is by the time you arrive at the octave it's completely out of tune with the octave when you get there um what that means is at the bottommost line what that means is uh if i were ha before temperament prior to our modern system if I played a C scale, and inside of that C scale is the D note, and if that C scale was untempered, in other words, the way nature gave it to us, and I hit that D note, then I hit a natural F scale, the way nature gave it to us, uh, and I hit that D note again, those two Ds would not sound the same. In other words, the notes of a scale become relational to the, the tonic, the first note of the scale. Uh, this was a big problem because composers couldn't mix keys together, okay? It, maybe you're getting the sense of this. We got something called microtones, which are kind of like tones that are slightly out of tune, and you know what out of tune sounds like. It's not fun to listen to. Now, what does this have to do with 432? Well, first of all, music is a circle. If I were a, an incredible artist and I drew a perfect circle and you didn't watch me draw it and it was absolutely perfect, you couldn't tell the starting or ending point of that circle, okay? So therefore, it's the same with music because where does it start exactly? Does it start on a C note? Does it start on an A note? Where does it start? 
And maybe it's a microtone between A and B flat, you know? So in other words, it's this infinite uh, spectrum that somebody had to come along and make a standard for. It's like weights and measures, all right? Who came along and said a pound weighs exactly this much and how much an ounce is exactly? Or uh, measurements, you know, uh, how did they come up, up with this is a foot, all right? So the same problem exists in music and it's an unsolvable problem. As I was reading through this his, uh, the story of harmony by Rex Weiler, I, uh, it became clear to me um, just what a major problem this is. And in fact, you know, I said, uh, I, I misinformed you when I said that Bach, um, well, it's true that Bach did, was one of the first to come along and help to develop our contemporary system. But our system is called equal temperament. And um, Bach actually rejected that system. Although he helped to come up with it, he rejected it and did other sorts of alternative tunings for his pianos. Um, interesting fact, uh, my producer once sent me an email Apparently on box manuscripts, there were these squiggly lines up top, there's like Baroque style designs on top of his manuscripts. And everybody thought initially that it was, uh, it was just, you know, fancifying the, the manuscript, uh, fancifying the score to make it look pretty up top. It turns out that there was meaning to all the curl cues and it had to do with how you tune the piano for that particular piece. Um, so in any case, um, where I misinformed you was that I might have given you the impression that once temperament was decided upon in Box Day, that was it. I just recently read in this book that uh, apparently this been struggle has been going on since the 1930s. All right. Finally, since this is one of those um, insolvable problems, a conundrum, uh, they just kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, well, let's stick with equal temperament. Here's the fact of the matter. When you're listening, I don't care how beautiful the music is. When you're listening to music, uh, basically you're listening to something that's out of tune. And if you want to hear what in tune sounds like, go to YouTube. And uh, I don't have any specifics there for you, but just uh, type in the search parameter. Um, uh just tuning or, or uh, hmm, what is it, untempered tuning. And you'll get examples of how, how pure this music sounds in comparison to what we listen to. Again, what does this have to do with 432? Well, 432, uh, 440 is our standard today. But I'll have you know that in the past, they, they experimented with all sorts of um, uh, uh, tunings for the A note. By the way, 440 re refers to A, I think A below middle C. Um, 440 cycles per second. Now, the New Agers and other people are claiming that uh, the conspiracy that, well, they didn't want us to listen to um, exact tuning because it would enlighten us all and make us all so happy that they couldn't control us. I would love to get to the source of who came up with this idea because I really find it doubtful, okay? Again, it's a standard. Who's to say how many cycles per second your first A note should be tuned to, all right? Uh, some people are saying it, it conforms with the Schumann resonance and that resonance, and that'd be cool if you can align music to the Schumann resonance, but apparently that's even changing today, um, this uh, resonant field, of uh, uh, vib vibratory field, is changing and people, some people are alarmed about this. Uh, in any case, um, given what I just told you, okay, if 4, 4, 440 is a cacophony, in other words, a dissonant sounding uh, tuning for the note A, it's still, it's still, it doesn't matter. If you tune to 432, you're still going to have the temperament problem and you're still going to have to do equal temperament on, on everything. And if you do equal temperament, what you're listening to is akin to cacophony. It's, it's, uh, it's, 
it's not going to say it's not going to be in tune now you're probably thinking well what are you talking about we're hearing music that isn't in tune because you're so adjusted to it i had a buddy back in college that said you know if you write a really bad song and you produce the whole thing and you you pay the radio stations to play it over and over and over again no matter how bad that song is people start buying it and even liking it which is part of the problem with contemporary hip hop and other crap that's coming out as being called music today. Um, all right, so that's my bottom line. 432 is not the problem. The problem is temperament. We cannot get pure sounding music. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, that's really where I come from with this thing. If, if, if 432 is more, I don't know, resonant and beautiful with the human soul, well, what are we going to do about the frickin' tuning? Because that's still dissonant and that's still out of tune. Now, bear in mind, this is really interesting stuff. When you start to read about what these guys were doing in the 1700s to solve this problem, don't forget, these guys didn't have oscilloscopes, okay? They couldn't scientifically measure the wavelength that was coming out of a tone. So therefore, they had to use very refined hearing to hear microtones. Bear in mind... The human ear can absolutely be trained for this. And in fact, Indian music has a number of microtones that people can even sing. The difference between on uh, and uh, all right, I, I can't even do it, but it's like slight, slight, slight difference. OK, um, an, an example in the visual world is scientists did an experiment where they uh, created this pen that could write microscopically. And they had people look under a microscope and write their name with this pen under the microscope. The thing was, they actually created legible words in spite of the fact that once you took it out from under the microscope, you couldn't even, you could barely see the word. Okay, so that's how fine, well, that's that shows you the potential of a human being, really, is what I'm getting to. Our senses have been so dulled. It's ridiculous. And what we're capable of and what we're actually doing, it's if we knew the extent of what we were capable of, we'd all be very unhappy people because we're stuck in this world where uh, we're almost imprisoned by our lack of ability to transcend our own senses and go be or refine our own senses to, to an extent where we'd literally be geniuses, all of us. Um, and that's maybe what the Illuminati New World Order people want to keep from us because they have a lot of secrets. Can you imagine what's in the vault at the Vatican? Why are those guys hiding that shit? And what right do they have to hide that shit is what I want to know. Anyway, so that's my take on 432. Whether it's true or not, it really don't matter. Okay, that's the bottom line. And let me see. Um, I guess that's it for my rant. Uh, we'll see, uh, you know, as this goes along, I'm just going to, as the muse strikes me, I'll, uh, I'll make more videos along the lines of various discussions about music. One thing I do want to discuss is approaches to practicing because one thing I've said um, to a lot of my students is that I don't, I'm not just a music teacher, but I have to be a psychotherapist and a Zen master. Um, because people, when people are confronted with music, the result is right there in the sound. It's immediate. You can hear whether it sounds good or it doesn't sound good. Um, so a lot of people have these blockages. Uh, they, they're immediately self-judgmental when they don't even have the right to be yet, especially beginners. They're so judgmental. It's like, wait, you can't judge yourself. You haven't even gotten good enough to judge yourself, you know? So I have to get people past their blocks. I have to get people to completely empty their minds. And, and uh, just like Zen in the art of archery, you become emptiness itself and then everything flows just rightly. And trust me, I'm still working on that personally, my own musicianship. I haven't gotten to that, uh, let's say, permanent Zen place where the, everything just flows. Half the times when I'm playing, it feels like a battle. Uh, but every once in a while, and this is why we're musicians, every once in a while, 
it feels like it's just flowing and everything's perfect and there's all this relaxation behind it and nothing, nothing could be better. On that happy note, I'll uh, bid you adieu and I'll see you in the future. Take care.